Good morning. How's the energy in the room? Yeah. So it seems the coffee has done its job by now. My name is Peter Giese. I'm head of the SAP Open Source Program Office, and in the next 20 minutes, I want to have a closer look together with you on the role of um, open source for improving digital autonomy and also on the Aptirora project, which helps your companies or your organization in raising the level of your digital autonomy by providing you an open source toolbox for managing your own cloud infrastructure. To my knowledge, there is no generally accepted definition of digital autonomy, but I guess most of you here in the room would agree that it is a capability to independently manage, control, and operate your own software, your own data, and your own hardware. And from a state point of view, especially from the EU member state point of view, um, they are concerned about the trend that the EU cloud market is constantly growing, but at the same time, the share European cloud providers have of this market is constantly falling. And this imbalance, of course, is uh, something the EU wants to address. That's why they have sent a clear goal, have set a clear goal to improve uh, Europeans' digital autonomy. But it's not just about um, states, it's also about your or our organizations and about individuals. In fact, when Richard Stallman defined the four freedoms of open source software and started the GNU, pro the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation, he did so because he wanted to have full control over his own computer, over his own hardware. So what is the challenge now? Looking back, some of you might still remember the early 90s, the time of the so-called cloud, uh, so-called Unix wars. And um, at that time, we had a lot of proprietary Unix providers for different hardware architectures. IBM had AIX for PowerPC. Sun had Solaris for Spark stations. Microsoft had Windows NT for x86 systems. And even though the operating system was supposed to provide a kind of portability hardware abstraction layer to your application so that you can easily port them from one hardware architecture to the other, it was not really possible because these proprietary Unix versions had a lot of subtle differences and it created quite some efforts for companies like SAP. We had to port our enterprise resource planning system R3 to all these different proprietary Unix versions. But then luckily open source in the form of GNU Linux came to the rescue. Uh, Linux gained in enterprise readiness and quality and also it was ported to all of these architectures and that's why SAP very early decided we want to port our R3 system to Linux so that we can enjoy the four freedoms, we can even modify or the, the operating system or fix a bug, and we can use it as our sole abstraction layer over all these hardware architectures. In hindsight, this might sound like a no-brainer, but when we announced this at CBIT Fair 1999, there was an article in PC World where an analyst from the US said, Linux will never penetrate backend systems, corporate America doesn't care about Linux. So I think this is an example of a quote that didn't age well, and the open source community, we together, proved him wrong. Now we just celebrated the 33rd birthday of Linux, and Linux is more or less running on the majority of servers in cloud and internet. So why did I talk about this? Because now in the cloud age, it's not about single servers anymore. It's about whole data centers, server farms with cloud network, uh, with network storage and compute. And today we have a little bit a similar situation as we had in the Unix wars. Now we have a little bit cloud wars. If you want to build a complex cloud native application and you do it on a hyperscaler, then in principle, the technology stack is open source. So we have containers, we have Kubernetes. Um, and that, of course, helps you in having a certain level of, of abstraction. But the different cloud providers, the hyperscalers especially, they have different control planes. They have different, why is it always moving? Oh. <laughs> um, they have different control planes. They have different versions of um, Kubernetes that they are using. They have different patch levels, different SLAs. 
So if you want to port a complex cloud native application today from one, one hyperscaler to another, it's quite some effort. So what would be required here would be a kind of distributed cloud operating system that really abstracts from these differences and provides you a porting layer for your complex cloud native or platform as a service applications. And this is also what some people call the cloud edge continuum. So the goal here is we want to build cloud native apps or you are a software as a service provider who wants to offer his uh, SaaS solution on all the different clouds, private cloud, hyperscaler. Um, and yeah, there's this whole spectrum. On the one hand, you have the hyperscalers like uh, AWS, Google. Then you have cloud providers like Ionos or Equinix. You might have own private data centers for your organization. And especially on the edge side, for instance, in your factory shop floor, or if you are the army in your submarine, which does not always have an internet connection, that is where all the data is created by the sensors of your machines. And of course, you want to process those, sen those sensor data ideally locally on the edge and not always sent to the cloud where you have high latency and high costs for data transfer. And that's why what we are targeting for is we want to have a write once, run anywhere. You might know this still from the old Java times for cloud native applications. And then you should be able to deploy your applications and process your data wherever you want, on the edge or in the hyperscaler or in the private data center. And this is what a lot of people call the cloud edge continuum. And this cloud edge continuum, that is, if you would have that, then on the one hand side, your organization would be able to run cloud native applications on your two server racks in your um, own data center, or you could run it in your private data center, or you could give it to a cloud provider like Equinix, or you can run it on the hyperscaler. So this would kind of level the playing field because the regional cloud providers would not be disadvantaged any longer uh, against the global hyperscalers, and it would empower you to have full control about your applications and data. And that is also now where we come to the solution. This cloud edge continuum is so important from the European Union's point of view that they started in an, an initiative called Cloud Infrastructure and Services, or CIS, as part of one of the important projects of common European interest. You might have heard about this in the context of the, uh, context of the European CHIPS Act, for instance, that chip factories are uh, built with funding, for, uh, with additional funding from the EU. And in this case here, the idea is that the EU has significant funding, 3.5 billion for the next three years. And um, this is spread over 113 organizations that will contribute to this overall cloud of uh, overall goal of building a multi-provider cloud edge continuum and 12 countries are involved. And one of these 113 organizations is the company I'm working for, SAP. We have one of the largest projects in this context, um, and we call this Apiro. And what we are building is a reference architecture for this cloud edge continuum for the parts infrastructure as a service and Kubernetes. The other projects that are part of the Psysys will build uh, complementing parts. And everything we build is published as open source. Here are just a few of the open source projects that we have published already in the context of this Apiro project. And all of these projects are published under Apache 2.0 license, so you are free to use it also for commercial purposes, except Garden Linux, which has, to, of course, to follow the Linux uh, license um, obligations. So in the interest of time, I just want to touch on two of these projects, Project Gardener and Project Ironcore, uh, and tell you a little bit more about what they are doing. So we have seen this target picture of the Cloud Edge continuum. And now if we are talking, you want to run a cloud native application on top of Kubernetes, for instance. Oftentimes, you are using the Kubernetes service from the hyperscaler or from a cloud provider. And as I already explained, they differ in subtle things like patch versions, APIs, the control planes are different. That's why to get to such a unified Vora layer, 
we are not consuming their services, but only their infrastructure as a service parts from the hyperscalers or in the case of cloud providers like Equinix, oftentimes that might be OpenStack, which gives you infrastructure as a service. And then on top, what we are um, establishing with Gardener is Kubernetes as a service with a global control plane that spans, spans all hyperscalers, all data centers, private data centers. And that way, we can manage our Kubernetes clusters and our fleets of clusters globally across all these different um, hyperscalers and uh, across the whole cloud edge continuum. That's the idea here. But now the question is, of course, what do you do in your factory shop floor where you just have two racks of servers or in your submarine? It would be kind of an overkill to install OpenStack there. That's why we have created our own infrastructure as a service for bare metal solution, which we call Iron Core. And this can be installed and operated with minimal um, administration co operation costs. And also, it requires only minimal hardware resources to provide as much compute power to your workloads as possible. And yeah, and, the, and it is optimized for spinning up Kubernetes Gardener clusters on top of it. So let's have a look how this looks in real life. Um, as an example, let's say in our edge data center, in our factory shop floor, because of some reason we want to deploy our open source Jitsi um, video conference services to have our own instance. And we want to run it on a Kubernetes cluster that we create as Gardener, and that in turn uses your local two server racks using Iron Core's infrastructure as a service. So how would this look like? Here we see our Apirora um, administration cockpit or portal. It's built also with open source software called Open Micro um, Front End Portal. And that is also an open source project, which is part of Apirora. I have already created here a project for my demo, which contains um, already one Kubernetes cluster. So if I click on this project, we see here one cluster is already existing. Now we create a new one. What we see here is we have the full choice. It will be much more in the future, but we can spin it up on the hyperscalers in private or cloud provider data center on OpenStack. But in our case, we want to spin it up on the edge using Iron Core. We give it a name, Linux Foundation Summit uh, Member Summit. We accept all the default settings for the Kubernetes cluster, except that we want to use Nginx for the ingress traffic. Um, out of the box, Gardener provides you features like automat automatically updating your operating system version on the worker nodes, or automatically updating your uh, Kubernetes patch versions. And if you run a factory shop floor, for instance, overnight, if the shop floor is not running, you can also automatically hibernate your cluster to save energy and costs. Uh, we click now the Create button here, and then the cluster is immediately created. You can see here the seconds it's kind of coming to life. Here are all the configuration settings of the cluster. And now we see here how it's created. This is now uh, videos moving 10 times faster because it takes a few minutes to spin up such a Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> and you can see how it's progressing, of course, all the worker nodes have to be fired up and all the services and so on. Um, and now that we have the cluster, we can have a look at the configuration data. We can download the cube config file. And from here on, everything feels like standard Kubernetes. So we can now import the cube config file into kubectl on the command line. And once we have imported, imported it, we can just with normal kubectl apply uh, deploy our Jitsi video conferencing open source solution as a workload in our edge cluster. Um, this goes pretty fast. And once we have deployed it, we can use standard cube control cluster info um, command to get information. In this case, we want to have the URL that we need to call Jitsi. Now we have typed this URL into the browser. And here's our Jitsi instance. And yeah, with that, we can start a new Jitsi meeting. So here's a start. I don't have participants now, that's why. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I would have more time, we would have done a live demo and you could have dialed in here. 
on site. Um, so to summarize, with the Apirora project, we are providing you an open source toolbox to provide uh, a cloud native portability, write runs, run anywhere layer. Um, it's, you can pick and choose so you don't have to consume it in an all or nothing fashion if you just want to use Iron Core as infrastructure as a service on the edge, or if you just want to use Gardener to spin up clusters on across several hyperscalers, that's uh, totally fine and possible. Some of these projects already have production grade uh, maturity. So at SAP, we are running more than 10,000 uh, productive Gardener clusters. And for instance, um, Equinix, one of the largest cloud providers worldwide, they published a tutorial on their own how to spin up Gardener clusters on Equinix infrastructures. Others of these open source projects, like the open micro front end platform, they are in very early stages. And that's why we are presenting it here. We would be more than happy uh, to get contributions from others, to get partners working with us on that, and also to include additional projects that might cover wide spaces of this cloud edge continuum and, um, and edit here. And we already have, of course, contributions from, for instance, Stack IT, which is the IT department of the German Lidl Schwarz um, concern or, or company. And yeah, there's one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> SAP is more than happy and really excited to announce that we are intending to donate all or transfer all of these projects into a new open source foundation, which we call Neo Nifos. <laughs> Neo Nifos is Greek and means more or less new cloud. Um, <laughs> the contracts for this new foundation have not yet been signed, so we are in the formation phase. Linux Foundation is, of course, uh, driving this um, formation phase, and we are in talks with designated and potential partners. And if some of you are interested, if this could be also something for you to join, then please let me know. We would be more than happy to include you, and you could still become a founding member. Um, and yeah, the, the advantage is by transferring these projects to the Linux Foundation Europe in this new foundation, we have a neutral governance, right? If you want to contribute as a company, you want to have investment protection, you want to be at the mercy of, of SAP to stop this or drive this into a different direction. And now with the new foundation, we will have a neutral governance protecting your investments for your contributions. Yeah, and that's why I would like to ask you to contribute that we can jointly build this open source toolbox for operating your own cloud infrastructures. Thank you. <laughs>